This is Tom Ricola, director of Dead Snow 1 and Dead Snow 2, and you're listening to Without Your Head. Welcome to the station of decapitation Without Your Head. I'm Nasty Neal. This is Annabelle Lecter. Yes, and we're very happy to be joined by the writers and directors of Goodnight Mommy, Veronica Franz and Severin Fiala. Hello. 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 Hi. We're so excited to have you guys. Uh, this movie's apparently pretty popular. Already. <laughs> All right. I, th- I think I think we it's can uh, be pretty sure it's go- you're gonna do pretty good. <laughs> yeah. What's that like? You know, it is it is your first feature film, and it's got all this buzz. Uh, what's all this experience been like for you guys? It's kind of crazy, actually. And surprising. <laughs> because in Austria, where we originally come from, most people are only interested in American films and films from the U.S. And our film was released in January in Austria. And no one didn't really care because it was not a film from the U.S. And now with all the buzz and the trailer success from the U.S., people in Austria keep asking us when our film will be shown there. <laughs> and we tell them it already was, but you didn't yeah. care. <laughs> but now, now they care and we have to re-release it in Austria. <laughs> so that's pretty but, cool also. Yeah, it's fantastic. Do you kind of like gloat about it and laugh at them like, ha? Ah. No, no. Also, you have to be very <laughs> thankful for everything. So we don't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's fantastic. Then why is this such a surprise to you? Did you think that it would maybe not get a, such a warm reception straight off the bat over here? I think it's kind of, you can you can plan that. In Austria, many films are made and not a single one comes to the U.S. because um, it's foreign language and people don't really care for the movies uh, in the U.S., we feel. So it was really a surprise that radios picked the film up at Venice Film Festival and they're really releasing it right now. So that's kind of not planable and really surprising. And making you making the film, you don't think of that. You just try to make your best. You just try to make a film. We we at least we try to make a film. We would like to see ourselves in cinema, and we are happy if the if the U.S. audience joins us now. Mm-hmm. There's really a lot of great imagery in the movie um, with the twins, and it's both like kind of childlike but also creepy. And um, was that. Was it hard to find the balance there so you didn't go too far one way or too far the other way? Yeah, it is. I mean, we wanted to start the film out from the children's perspective. So we asked ourselves, how do children perceive the world and how do uh, they see it? And we came to the conclusion for us that children like uh, include fairy tales and nightmares and dreams a lot more in their perception of the world than grown-ups would do. So the first half of the film had to be some kind of like fairy tale like and then when the perspective shifts and um, yeah the second part happens let's say it's like that uh, the blinds are pulled up and the horror happens like documentary like in bright daylight so we always knew we wanted to have this uh, twist and this shift uh, in the way the film would feel like um, to make it even like to make the ending even stronger and more unpleasant to watch. Mm-hmm. And of course, it it's the balance, and you had to find it in like the editing room. But yeah, we had this plan from the start on. It is, uh, it is really amazing that the perspective changes in the film, but that just watching it, that, you, uh, that the audience can feel dramatically differently about these characters as they go. Mm-hmm. And... That it, that entire emotional shift is is so impressive that that worked. What do you think it was specifically that made that work? Yeah, we we don't know actually. I mean, we only know that we were always interested in in uh, films that some kind of shift uh, the perspective because it's like you root for the for the children at the beginning and. It's, much more interesting what it does to you and to yourself as a viewer if that somehow changes because you have to like ask yourself questions about you and how you saw it all so that's what we were interested in like in confronting the audience maybe uh, with themselves and what makes it work i mean i don't know and also because we think people have several identities within within themselves so they have like uh, the evil side and they have the angel side and 
Um, they are not, you know, people are not only uh, bad or good, they are all of it together. And it depends on the circumstances they're in, uh, what kind of, um, comes out. Or, yeah, what comes out. So, um, yeah, we and believe it, in that. And it, it also depends on this, on the perspective. So if you're looking at the whole story from the children's perspective, um, then you, of course, See the mother is very mysterious and very evil. And if you turn perspective, it's the complete opposite. So it's something about how we see the world and how perspectives can clash that we we wanted to talk about. And maybe a simple answer why it works is that we chose children that are kind of they appear to be very fragile and very beautiful at first and gentle and sweet. So you would instantly like them and. Uh, okay protecting them yeah you want to protect yeah. them when it all shifts it's it's You're even surprised. more shocking and, <laughs> and surprising so that's what we try to do at least yeah and she is not very particularly likable from the beginning not even just in her appearance and as you're watching you you know uh, for me anyways i was watching kind of trying to rationalize all oh, this is maybe this is why she's doing this but it is really really hard to like her and I feel like that's exactly what was supposed to happen because the same thing right. with the kids when they start they really really want this to work and it's just not yeah because you're on the side of the children at first and they you see what they see and they see a mother they uh, or a woman uh, they hardly recognize uh, as their mother or they don't recognize so um, it doesn't make sense what how this woman uh, behaves that's that's how they see the world the children, so that's why it. Yeah, you are the same boat, like the children. The the old saying is always never to work with uh, children or animals. Uh, what was it like? Uh, was it hard to find uh, twins that really uh, worked for the role? And what was it like working with them? Actually, we think it's 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 wrong. The sentence is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we know that that it's it's taught in film schools that never that you should never work with uh, uh, children or animals. But actually, we thought it's quite easy. <laughs> Because children, as we felt, uh, children, they really trust you. So if you tell like a child actor something to like act this or that way, then you can be sure that he will try his best to behave exactly the way you, you told him to. And if it's not good, then you know you told him something wrong. And if you do the same with a like grown-up actor who has his own preparation done, his own interpretation of the role in mind, oh. and maybe thinks you're an idiot as a director, then he will, of course, also say, yes, I'll do it exactly the way you want. But that's certainly not true in many cases. And if it's then bad, what, what's in the scene, you can never be sure if you did something wrong or if the actor simply like, um, yeah, doesn't do what, what you told him to. Yeah, and I think your sensitivity towards children just shows through through this in, entire interview, and you wouldn't have had the same uh, emotional connection, I think, with these kids if they were not comfortable with these roles. And you, you guys make it comfortable. Uh, everything, just the oh, scenes of them playing the entire the entire film. It just it's very very natural, and even your responses to questions now. It, you just use logic. You know, we ask a question, and why would you do this? And you talk about the responses of people. Like, real people would have responses. In so many movies, people have very illogical responses to things, and that really separates you as an audience. Yeah, we had a very playful atmosphere on the set, and we, we kind of tried to play uh, with the children a lot. And, um, yeah, we didn't give them the script. We shot it in sequence, so... They kind of experience the shooting as a as a detective game or a, a crime game. So we would only give them the basic situation, and then they kind of uh, got from day to day bits and pieces of the story. And they would try to even ask our whole uh, shooting team, uh, "Is she our mom? Is she not our mom? What is, what is going to happen?" So we kind of tried, you know. Um, with such more darker films, you have to try to have the atmosphere uh, as light as possible on the set. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we had, a, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> and children still say it was the best summer of their lives. So that's oh, really? something we're very wow. proud of. Because you wouldn't imagine it seeing it the film, but they still think uh, of it as their best summer. 
Yeah. Why was? And they were, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Go on. They were not allowed to see the film. Only they have oh. only the first part of the film. But when they saw some, uh, when they saw the first half, they were so surprised it was not as boring as they would have su- su- suspected it to be. <laughs> uh, why was uh, shooting in 35 millimeter so important? Your yeah, first first answer to that is that it simply looks better for us. It has like it feels alive. It has more secrets to it, and we tested a lot of digital formats uh, as well. But we didn't like um, the look so much, so we chose uh, 35. And another thing that that's very good with 35, we believe in, is um, that it makes much more uh, concentration on the whole set. Because if you shoot digitally and with children, most people advise you to just press the button and let the children play, and then maybe after 10 minutes, something's good, something good's gonna happen. And we think that's very boring, uh, not only for us, but for all team members, because they're standing aside and they're falling asleep because everyone's waiting that something good happens by chance. And we don't like this by chance. And we wanted it um, like if you shoot on film, you just press the button and you know you have maybe 20 seconds or 30 seconds for the good stuff to happen. And it has to happen right now and not uh, in the future or some, and, uh, some, sometime else. So that makes a lot more concentration on the set, we feel. Um, how did you guys uh, get together in the first place? I used to be Veronica's babysitter. I mean, the one of her children. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, all right. <laughs> so we know each other like for 15 years. Wow. And as, as Severin was very into films when he was like 14, um, he didn't want me to pay him in cash. But in VHS cassettes, so we would, <laughs> we would go to the video store and kind of rent rent uh, films there. And yeah, after me coming home uh, late at night, uh, we kind of would watch those films. <laughs> did you uh, did you influence one another's interests in film? I mean, here's a here it is. This is a horror movie. Who liked what? Actually, we like we like. I think we liked it both horror movies so it was yeah i mean of course there there's a time uh, time an age difference of mm-hmm. 20 years between us so that makes maybe a difference in uh with which films we grew up but we we both uh, love horror films but we also love art films so Severin, do you remember this one uh, one night when we kind of uh, saw those four, <laughs> I don't, I don't uh, yeah, like... Actually, like, we started out watching Faces by John Kasavetes. Then we watched uh, Tetsuo uh, Part 2, The Body Hammer. <laughs> After that one, we watched Lancelot de Lac de Bresson, and then Friday the 13th, Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan. <laughs> so it's a very wild <laughs> Uh, that maybe what like defines us as filmmakers. We like a variety, a huge variety of films, and um, yeah, we hope that they all come together in our film. That there is at least a part of everything we like in our own films. Mm-hmm. Now, what are your thoughts on the uh, on the trailer being you know called the scariest? Uh, a lot of people consider it the scariest trailer ever made. Of course, we're very proud, and we hope that people aren't disappointed by the movie afterwards. <laughs> uh, yep. Um, is there a secret to making a great trailer? Because you want to show uh, a lot that's in the movie, but at the same time, you don't want to show too much. We think it's very crucial that you, as a director, don't interfere too much with the trailer because uh, you're too close to your own movie, and it's it's good that someone from the outside who wants to sell the movie makes the trailer because they can look from it like can look at it from a distance and they will for sure do a better job so we didn't interfere too much uh, with the trailer because we as directors we wouldn't want anything to be in the trailer it's like no you you must show this or that and this must be in the trailer so it's a trailer with like it's only black but That's the perfect director's trailer. It doesn't show a single scene. No, but to tell you the truth, we made the Austrian trailer, <laughs> and it never, it never has been such a success. So <laughs> <laughs> that should be in the uh, in the extras on DVDs and Blu-ray. <laughs> yeah, true. They both both trailers, and you can see the difference yeah. when a director makes a trailer or when <laughs> a film company makes a trailer. <laughs> The movie comes out tomorrow, the 11th. Uh, it's going to be at theaters, and um, 
I we've seen it. We loved it, and I uh, hope everyone out there is looking forward to seeing it. And are you guys looking forward to uh, watching it with uh, with audiences uh, at festivals and the screenings? Yeah, we are always very nervous when watching it with other people, and maybe too excited to stand it. But yeah, we have had good reactions with two fainted people so far. Um, wow. And I'm very proud of that also. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful job to be in when you can be proud of making people faint. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also with Red Cross, so I know both sides. <laughs> <laughs> so you're ready to help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, we want to thank you both for coming here. It's been, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was good to talk to you, too. Very cool. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Good luck. Good. Thank, Thank you. Yep. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. This is Tom Noonan. You're listening to Without Your Head.